Lingo had this idea, you know, of a football team, and it, which would be his next sort of big promotional idea. So they're going hunting. They're out in the, yeah, in the swamplands there in, in Marion County in Ohio. And Lingo sort of tells him he wants to start a pro football team. And he wants Jim Thorpe to be the player coach and manager. And he would pay him $500 a week, which was a lot of money at the time, to run the football team, but also work at the dog kennel as a manager. So Thorpe's obviously like very interested. That's a lot of money. You know, oh, he gets to play football, you know. But there's two catches. The one catch is the team has to be made up of entirely of Native Americans. And two, that the real main purpose is to advertise his dog kennel and his Airedales. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey, gang, how are you? It's Tim Hanlon, as uh, announced, and uh, the little podcast that you've discovered is called Good Seats Still Available, the curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. I can't think of a better way to celebrate the uh, beginning of the uh, current NFL pro football season, uh, then by uh, tackling, no pun, uh, or maybe pun, uh, another uh, episode in the realm of pro football. We're going to go back to some of the earlier days of pro football. Uh, our guest this week is a guy by the name of Chris Willis, and he is the uh, resident historian at NFL Films, so an interesting guy from a number of different perspectives. But uh, in particular for this episode, we're going to be talking about a story uh, that uh, is kind of hard to believe if you really think about it. Um, the book is called Walter Lingo, Jim Thorpe and the Orang Indians, How a Dog Kennel Owner, yes, a dog kennel owner, created the NFL's most famous traveling team. And the story behind it, we'll get into it in much more depth in a couple of minutes here. Um, think about it. This is a guy, Walter Lingo, a, a dog breeder uh, in, the, in central Ohio, uh, who frankly, couldn't think of a better way to promote his dogs and the breeding of such, Airedales, uh, the breed, uh, which were all the rage in the Roaring Twenties, uh, than by buying an NFL football franchise and using it as a promotional platform for his dogs and his kennel. Um, and in addition to that, uh, part of the promotional uh, specter of the team was hiring Jim Thorpe, one of the original NFL Hall of Famers, uh, and a and an athlete uh, extraordinaire in both uh, football and in baseball. Oh, and in the Olympics as well, uh, revered as one of uh, America's greatest athletes, certainly of the uh, the first half century, uh, if not longer, uh, to run the team and to be a player and a coach and and hire all Native Americans like Jim Thorpe was uh, to play on this team. And, and, uh, it's just, it, it's a mind boggling story. And, and any of our friends, and we know we have a few out there, uh, who live in the Los Angeles area who fancy themselves as, uh, uh screenwriters and, and looking for story ideas in the realm of sports. Well, this just may be one of those. Um, and, and it just, it's the, the, some of the little intricacies of, you know, a traveling team that, uh, you know, did okay on the field, not so great, frankly. Uh, but, uh, uh you know, uh, was known for, uh, some interesting uh, hijinks at halftime with these uh, Airedale dogs who performed. And and again, in a ragtag National Football League that was uh, clearly not as uh, uh, defined and uh, robust as it is today. So a fascinating story uh, ahead in the next couple of minutes with our guest Chris Willis from NFL Films about uh, the Urang Indians of the early 1920s NFL uh, in just a second. Uh, we want to remind you, of course, that we are again uh, sponsored by our friends at Audible, the uh, the amazing audiobook company that uh, uh, dares you to give a free trial for 30 days and a get a free audiobook download for you to try and, and enjoy the Audible service. And uh, if you indeed want to do that, and I can, can encourage you more enough to do that, uh, it's audibletrial.com slash good seats uh, for your free audiobook download and your free 30 day trial of Audible, uh, the amazing audiobook service. That's audibletrial.com slash good seats. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from. They play on just about every device that uh, that you've got out there. And uh, I love uh, the uh, the audiobooks that Audible has, and uh, it's addictive. And uh, I think you will enjoy giving it a free trial uh, and perhaps even subscribing for a longer period of time. That's audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30-day uh, trial of Audible service and your free audiobook download. Give it a try. We appreciate your doing so, and I'm sure the folks at Audible will 
as well. All right, so uh, let us skate now into our uh, very interesting conversation, the uh, rarely or not, uh, with Chris Willis from NFL Films. We're going to talk about Walter Lingo, the owner, uh, Jim Thorpe, the uh, player coach, and the team called the Urang Indians of the early 1920s here, uh, uh, 1920s NFL, of course, here on the podcast. Maybe for our, our audience, you can give uh, uh, our listeners a sense of, you know, what you do for a living and maybe perhaps how you came to the story in the first place. I think it's uh, probably directly related. No? Yeah, a uh, little bit. You know, I've been uh, here at NFL Films since 1996, uh, 21 years now uh, as head of the research library. So my uh, day-to-day job is uh, mainly working with our producers and finding uh, their um footage and uh, research material, you know, for, the, for all our shows, for our broadcast partners. I had known a little bit about uh, the NFL in the 1920s. That's one of my favorite eras, the 20s and 30s, sort of how the NFL got started. You know, being from Ohio, a native, you know, I fell in love with football early, you know, so, you know, how the game got started has always intrigued me and sort of, wow, you know, look at, you know, sort of this rags to riches stories. And uh, so through some of that research and some of my writing, you know, over the years, um, uh, the story of the Urang Indians uh, always kept popping up. You know, in 2000, I was able to go to Leiru, Ohio, where the Urang Indians were founded um, and interviewed um, a couple of people uh, that were associated with the team, uh, including the son of the owner um, and a um, high school player who actually practiced against the Indians. Um, and so they were telling me these stories. So that's sort of my introduction into um, the Orang Indian story, you know, back in Ohio. And two of those uh, interviews turned into a chapter in my uh, first book, which was called Old Leather, uh, An Oral History of Early Pro Football in Ohio, which came out in 2005. So I had known about the story and I kept coming back to like, oh, you know what, that would be interesting to sort of jump in in more detail than the two short chapters that I originally wrote about. So that's how I sort of got around to um, tackling the full story of, of the Urang Indians. So before before we jump into that that part of it, why um, what is it about the 20s and the and the, you know, the early days of the NFL that uh, that intrigues you? You're not the only one. And it seems like, uh, I don't know, there's almost sort of a uh, sort of a legendary quality to it and maybe some some unearthed stories that have really never been told. But I'm just curious as to why that that era of the league versus, say, other eras, uh, given, your, given well, your day job. I think mainly because even working for the league or even just being a football fan in general, um, I've always been, you know, interested in how – you know, how the game sort of got started and why, you know, because it's so popular now. And I think because of NFL films, even where I work, we're a visual sport. You know, people love to watch it, you know, whether it's the highlights or the games. And, you know, sort of from the 50s, even to the 60s, you know, the Super Bowl era, everybody knows a lot more about those players and how the game, you know, sort of developed and how it became so popular. You know, the number one sport, the number one sporting event with the Super Bowl. But I always go back to those 20s and 30s just thinking, you know, these are the sort of pioneers uh, and the people and the owners and the fans who sort of got it started. If it weren't for them, because the sport was not as popular as, as Major League Baseball um, or even horse racing, boxing and golf, you know, in the 20s and 30s. And obviously college football was even bigger than the NFL and pro football. I just don't think those stories get enough in or uh, sort of enough attention or they haven't been written about as much. I mean, you know, if you say Joe Montana or even Jim Brown, Johnny Unitas, you know, Tom Brady right now, everybody knows something about them. But, you know, some of these pioneers and some of these stories like the Orang Indians, you know, who were only around for two years but did help the NFL sort of grow, I think they're important. So that's why I, I like that era. I like going back to it and just like, you know what, um, as much as I like the game now and I like spending my weekends watching college football and pro football, those sort of pioneers, you know, they do need our attention. And, I, you know, that's why I like sort of jumping into it. I call it the Stone Age and I go back to the Stone Age a lot. Yeah. So we, we've actually had a couple of Stone Age conversations. So, you know, this show is only about 27, 28 episodes old. But, uh, you know, we had a couple of weeks ago uh, a story about the uh, the Memphis Tigers, uh, you know, a team which never actually played in the NFL. Right. But were part of, you know, maybe one of the first Southern pro teams. Uh, in the late 20s that uh, had some influence and, and arguably, um, you know, uh, still has some influence given the uh, the namesake of the Memphis Tigers uh, University uh, athletics program and, 
you know, the Cleveland Rams, obviously, later we've done a story and we've done uh, a couple of conversations around, you know, just a, a whole bunch of other and, and, and more to come. But this one, you know, strikes me as being perhaps the most uh, thus far original and uh, frankly, kind of hard to believe uh, mm-hmm. story, at least the origins of such uh, when you compare it to what today's modern NFL uh, is of today. What Maybe you can give our audience a bit of a, a background about sort of this guy, Walter Lingo, and uh, maybe the origins of how this story got going. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the original ideas why I wanted to tackle the story. Uh, I mean, a, a few things have been written about it, but, but not in, in this sort of detailed form of a full book. Uh, I think most people are familiar with Jim Thorpe, who was the star player uh, that he recruited to run the team. But I wanted to Obviously, his story is in there, and, you know, we can talk a little bit about him, but I wanted to mainly focus on Walter Lingo because I think he's sort of the unsung hero because it was his idea, you know, and, and Walter Lingo was the son of a dry goods um, store owner who uh, in La Rue, if, if you don't know, is a town of, and it still is, about a town of like seven to 800 people. <laughs> it has not grown since the 1920s. It's pretty much a really small town in Marion County, which is um, about... 40, 45, 50 minutes uh, north of Columbus. Um, it's also the home, you know, Marion, Ohio is real close to it. And that's where Warren G. Hardy, the president was uh, at the time in the roaring twenties. But, but Walter Lingo, his dad owned his dry goods store, but he wanted to pursue his passion. And his passion was selling dogs. He wanted to grow the, the greatest and biggest uh, Airedale dog kennel in the, in the world or in the country and in the world. And he did, you know, by the, by the roaring twenties, he was, you know, one of the most successful uh, dog breeders, especially of Airedales uh, in the United States. You know, he was selling up to 10,000 dogs or more uh, a year, um, spending close to $2,000 in advertising, which I thought was a little too much. But when I did research, you know, he had ads in over a dozen national magazines, including Field of Stream, Forest and Stream, you know, a Dogdom, you know, even Vanity Fair, and, you know, uh, newspapers. So he had built himself to be this very successful businessman. And so, you know, he sort of recruited Jim Thorpe, you know, for this team. And I always went back to like, why did he do it? You know, and I'd say that in the introduction, mainly because he was bigger than the NFL. Like the pro football was nothing at the time. You know, it wasn't pro baseball. It wasn't golf. It wasn't boxing. It wasn't horse racing, like, you know, college football, like all these were bigger sports. He chose a pro football team that was in the NFL, which was just starting its third year in 1922. So, so Lingo really interests me. And, um, and I was able to talk to his son. His son's actually still living there in Ohio. And he sort of was able to tell me these stories about his dad and, you know, owning the dog kennel company. And, but you're right. It, when you hear the story, it doesn't sound like it's true, but it, but it was in 1922 was here. This dog kennel owner wants to start an NFL team, you know, with Jim Thorpe uh, operating it. And, uh, um, and it just makes for such a unique story, especially now that the NFL has become so popular. Like I mentioned about the rags to riches, this is really part of that rags to riches. Well, tale. before, before we get into the actual team itself, I mean, maybe just a, a couple of seconds here on this, on this lingo character, right? Because, mm-hmm. So I, why, what is this? What is this? The uh, magic, I guess, of this Airedale breed dog and the kennel idea behind it. I, I, any insight as to sort of why this was a thing, and, and frankly, why he was successful at it? I, I got, a, I got a sense that this was a popular breed and and a and a you know a significant business for him, both before, during, and after his ownership of this team. Yeah, well, the Airedale originally uh, came from Great Britain, you know, so it was it was a dog that was founded and breeded o- overseas. So, uh, so it wasn't as popular as you know the Hound or, or a few others, you know, sort of in the United States. So he wanted to separate himself. You know, he thought in order to separate himself and become you know you know something a little bit more popular or have this greatest kennel you know he had to breed a dog that was different so he chose the Airedale which wasn't quite as popular at the time you know uh he started uh his business around 1912 so this is a little bit before you know he got became so popular so so he started breeding an Airedale to sort of be this greatest you know sort of hunting dog you know like he wanted a dog that could sort of separate itself you know you know and that hunters and farmers 
uh, could use, you know, practically, you know, whether, uh, and eventually he, he did that with, with some of his breeds was, you know, he would ship his dogs out to certain farms and he would say, well, this dog is a better as a show dog. This dog is better as a hunting dog, you know, or a big game hunting, you know, hunt, you know, deer and, you know, bear or, you know, some of the, you know, uh, you know, sort of high end, you know, hunting, uh, animals, uh, or this one can do farm work. Like he became more specific and, and obviously the Airedale was the one that kind of popped because nobody was, especially in the United States, nobody was really tackling that breed to the extent that he wanted to, you know, where he was trying to, you know, make it as good as he could. So if you wanted to, you could buy the best hunting dog, you know, that you wanted, or, you know, the best, you know, for, for farm work, or, you know, if you wanted to show a dog, you know, like he became that specific in his breeding and in his training, um, there in La Rue and around, you know, you know, some of the farms in Ohio. So that's what sort of separated him. You know, the Airedale, like I said, wasn't as popular. And he sort of made it popular that if, and that's where the advertising came in. That's what made him very popular around the country was he advertised these Airedale. So if you kind of like were looking for a hunting dog and you're looking in magazines, you know, uh, hunting magazines, dog magazines, you found his ads because they were very popular. They are very, you know, you know, artistic, you know, he put photos and artwork where most people just put a small ad, you know, didn't even have a photo, just didn't have, you know, big font or anything like that, but he did. So that's where he became successful. That's where he made a lot of money, you know, to sort of, you know, establish himself. Yeah, it seems that, uh, you know, uh, by the, you know, sort of the, the mid to late uh, 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, right, the uh, the Airedale breed, it was uh, almost kind of the rage, I guess, when, amongst dog owners, including, you mentioned him before, but Warren Harding, who was uh, newly uh, ensconced in the White House, apparently had one as well there. So not, not a yeah. bad platform for promotion, right? Yeah, no, he that helped too. You know, um, I mean, the myth is people thought it was from his kennel, but which you would think it was, but it was not. It was from from a Toledo kennel where his, uh, the dog was named Laddie Boy, who was in the White House. But but you saw all that. That was a big thing in Washington. Like, wow, here's an Airedale in the White House, and that became even more popular, and it helped his sales a lot. You know, considering that he was from Marion County. Well, it seems this is that Walter Lingo was uh, still quite the showman, and obviously uh, somebody who would discovered with some help, I guess, uh, the the power of advertising and direct mail and catalogs and and whatnot and um, and, and built a significant business. So, you know, uh, given all of that success and given all that sort of, I guess, maybe he even named himself the king of dogs. I don't know if it was a name given to him or he self-proclaimed himself as such. Um, so, OK, why then what 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 upside to a professional football team in a league that you mentioned earlier uh, wasn't even in the top five, I guess, of sort of national pastimes or sports, you know, uh, in, in that, at that time. Well, I think for Walter, although dogs were his passion, he, he was also a outdoorsman and he was a sports fan. He wasn't a huge football fan, you know, uh, per se at, at the time, but he did like sports. He did like being outdoors. He also liked mingling with sports celebrities. He, um, uh, you know, especially baseball. He became friends with Ty Cobb and Tris Speaker at the time. Um, uh, Jack Dempsey, uh, you know, a little bit later, you know, and, and obviously Jim Thorpe too. So, so he liked sports. It wasn't that he was, uh, you know, against football, you know? Um, so I think what he always thought, he always thought out of the box a little bit, you know, but he was always looking to promote his business and was also looking to promote the next big idea. You know, you know, some of them only lasted a year or like with the football team it was only two years, but I think he always liked the outdoors, you know, sporting, you know, sports activities, anything like that. And he was always, always looking for that type of Avenue, you know, and, and maybe he thought, Hey, you know what? Baseball's established, you know, um, and plus baseball six months of the year football is only like three months near the end of the year so maybe he thought just doing a football team you know with his good buddy jim thorpe that might be a little bit better you know and stuff he doesn't have to finance you know six months of a baseball or you know golf lasses you know for multiple months and boxing is you know that type of stuff so so he might just thought oh this is a quick way we can travel the country and um you know and do this football team uh to advertise my dog kennel <laughs> So let's talk about then this guy named Jim Thorpe, right, where I think uh, obviously a well-known and, and, and certainly, you know, original Hall of Famer in, in, in the NFL. 
Um, perhaps a little bit of background on, on Jim Thorpe and, and perhaps maybe a bit of a hint as to how these two gentlemen actually became friends in the first place. Well, Jim Thorpe, uh, like you said, um, especially at the time of when they, they started the team was still at the height of his uh, athletic ability, you know, was still probably the most well-known and greatest athlete, you know, in the United States at the time, um, had gone to Carlisle, um, Indian school, uh, in Pennsylvania, you know, became an all American player, uh, and is probably well known more for winning two Olympic golds in the 1912 Olympics, uh, in the decathlon and the pentathlon, uh, sort of pro- proclaimed, you know, the greatest athlete in the world. Um, and then sort of had those medals stripped, you know, because he was, uh, recognized as playing minor league baseball for money. So that it sort of, put a little damp, but then became a professional that sort of started his professional career. He was playing major league baseball at the New York giants. Uh, then he played pro football at the camp bulldogs starting in 1915. So that's where, and that was sort of definitely at his height where he was, you know, probably the best pro football player at the time was playing major league baseball, you know, uh, also, um, which is kind of like Bo Jackson or Deion Sanders, you know, in modern times, you know? Um, so, at the time, and then when the NFL was founded, you know, he was the first president and was still, you know, playing for Canton and played for Cleveland in 1921. So he was definitely on the radar of anybody who wanted to uh, get into sort of, um, you know, professional sports. And uh, I think the connection uh, mainly is their connection of, of the outdoors. You know, Jim Thorpe being from Oklahoma, you know, most – Native Americans liked to hunt and swim and be outdoors. Um, and like I mentioned before, Lingo liked, you know, being connected to famous athletes and celebrities and, 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 and those type of name dropping. So, uh, and because he was playing in Canton, Canton was only like 90, was it 90 minutes away from Marion, you know, there in Ohio. So they sort of hung out. Um, Lingo invited him to, on hunting trips, uh, you know, several times. Uh, in the late teens and early twenties, um, to sort of hang out there at, at the dog kennel and go hunting, you know, uh, uh at night. Um, uh, so that's where the sort of relationship occurred and, and sort of grew to this sort of, uh, you know, famous idea of, of the Orang Indians. It also seems to me that, uh, that Lingo had some appreciation, I guess, for, uh, the Indian culture as well, which obviously is a big part of, of the Thorpe legend, right? You talking about Native American history and yeah, correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Leroux, Ohio. Uh, it was like I said, it's a small town there, but it also uh, had a lot of Indian history. You know, I believe the Wyandotte Indians sort of had a camp there. Uh, so Walter, growing up, heard all these sort of you know Native American stories, and and he he liked reading about you know about sort of you know the Indian way of life. Um, so it was something that definitely captured his his attention, you know, and sort of just being friends with Jim Thorpe and, you know, uh, uh, you know, Indians always liked, you know, to have animals around and, 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 and to have dogs. So, and they could connect with animals. They sort of had this little instinct that, that Walter liked to, to have around his dogs, you know, that they were really, um, so I think, yeah, all that sort of connected him to, to, you know, sort of starting his team and, and being a part of that. Well, all right. So let's let's talk about. So we're, let's uh, sort of uh, put a date around this, right? So we're talking about circa, I guess, what nineteen twenty one or so. Uh, this guy Walter Lingo and his uh, successful uh, kennel uh, uh, enterprise uh, is is chatting it up with a couple of folks, including Jim Thorpe. Uh, I guess hunting. Uh, I guess for possum, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, well, yeah, they might have been hunting something. I, I don't know what, but uh, the yeah the. The story goes, um, after the 1921 NFL season, uh, Lingo invites Jim Thorpe and, and one of his teammates, Pete Kalak, uh, on a hunting trip. And uh, to now, unbeknownst to Thorpe, he just thinks he's going hunting. But Lingo had this idea, you know, of a football team, and it, which would be his next sort of big promotional idea. So they're going hunting. They're out in the, in the swamplands there in, in Marion County in Ohio, and Lingo sort of tells him he wants to start a pro football team and he wants Jim Thorpe to be the player coach and manager. And he would pay him $500 a week, which was a lot of money at the time 
to run the football team, but also work at the dog kennel as a manager. So Thorpe's obviously like very interested. That's a lot of money, you know. Oh, he gets to play football, you know. Uh, and the, but there's two catches. The one catch is the team has to be made up of entirely of Native Americans, and two that the real main purpose is to advertise his dog kennel and his Airedales. So Thorpe just thinks this is just a crazy idea, but he's on board. He and Kalak. Uh, said, yeah, we'll both do it. Uh, let's do the, do the team. So for 1922, they're going to play pro football in the NFL with this all Native American team and pretty much travel, uh, be a traveling team uh, in the NFL. All right. So I'm curious as to if you can get some into some sense of what what uh, Jim Thorpe is thinking. Right. So th- this is a guy, I mean, for those who, you know, have not gone back and, and done the research, and, and I'm, I'm sure some of our audiences. Uh, aware of him, but maybe not necessarily the the, the depth of, of some of his just, you know, amazing athletic career on a lot of different fronts. But, you know, here's a guy who, you know, for most of the teens, right, was uh, in, uh, you know, Major League Baseball, right? A big Major League Baseball player, um, you know, and, and obviously an Olympic athlete as well. Um, and, uh, and, and playing a, a bunch of years in the fledgling and uh, somewhat uh, rough around the edges uh, National Football League. So given all that pedigree, I mean, what do you think's going through Thorpe's head with this uh, somewhat odd idea about, you know, OK, I'll 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 run the kennels during the day and I'll play football, you know, and 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 uh, help this team uh, in this this league that isn't even, you know, really tremendously solid at this point. Well, no, I I, I mean, obviously, I think the money helped. <laughs> it was a, a decent amount of money to to to, to do the job. Um, but I also think he. I mean, it was probably right up his alley. You know, he's like, oh, wait, I mean, I mean, I get to go do stuff outdoors. I can go, you know, hunt, be around dogs, train them, uh, and then also go play football, you know, on the weekends. Uh, so I, I don't think it took much, you know, to twist his arm to do it, you know. Uh, and he probably just thought it would be fun to do, you know. And, and, and you know, obviously, you know, having a friend like, you know, Water Lingo, you know, behind him, he, he'd say, okay, that's fine, you know. So, um, uh, and he also got to think at this time, like I said, you know, if he has, has a salary, you know, he's probably going to go where that goes. So, um, so he knew, hey, you know what, once I get done baseball, you know, I have a football team to go to, and that's what I want to do. Like I said, I think for being with a friend like Lingo, uh, being able to be outdoors, you know, being around dogs um, and then playing football on the weekend, you know, once he's done with his baseball season, I, I think he, that part of it, he didn't think was probably crazy or anything about it. You know, um, maybe the dogs being part of the football show or the game, that might've been a little, you know, crazy for him, but, uh, but he was definitely on board to, to working with his good friend lingo. Okay. So uh, let's get a sense then of, um, so I, I guess a, a, another sort of, uh, I don't know, red flag, yellow flag, some kind of interesting uh, flag to me is this idea of fielding a team that's uh, comprised of all Native Americans. Um, Was that something that Lingo was kind of doing, you know, I don't know, uh, bend over backwards to make it irresistible to Thorpe, given his Indian uh, background? Or was this sort of a a noble uh, understanding of the Indian uh, culture and and a desire to truly see the, the Native American succeed as a football team. I, any of the, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of the, the, what are the, uh, the motives here for the idea of an all Indian or all native American team? Yeah, I, I think the main thing for lingo, because lingo was more of a salesman, he's more of a promoter. So he's thinking more of how do I get fans out to a pro football game to see my dog, see my team play, but mainly also to see my dogs perform <laughs> And one is have a star. So he had Jim Thorpe. He's got the biggest name in sports and the biggest name in football at the time. So what's the other hook is, okay, he's going to be the player coach for a all Native American. That's going to get fans out. You know, if, if, if it was just him, Jim Thorpe and a bunch of other guys that nobody knows, then it's, it, you know, it's okay because you got a star, you know, and you need to star of the show. But so I think Lingo was mainly thinking – this is a way of if we going to be a traveling team, because they weren't going to play home games. They're going to be a traveling team. They need to get fans to the games. So Jim Thorpe and his all, you know, his all native American football team, that would do it, you know? And over those two years, they didn't win a lot of games, but they did get fans to come out and gave the NFL 
more publicity than the majority of the teams that were in the league at the time. It almost seems like he's uh, uh, lingo is is borrowing from I you know something that was largely common, especially in things like baseball and Negro League baseball in particular. The idea of barnstorming and the idea of sort of a, it's a show. It's almost like a circus. It's a it's an event. It comes to your town and you know there's a whole bunch of days ahead of time to promote it and and. You know, it's not just the game per se. And frankly, the game may even be almost uh, secondary to the idea of the spectacle kind of rolling up into your town. Well, definitely. Well, that's definitely he thought of that of starting a team. He wanted to do advertise his dog. So so he wasn't thinking about winning games, building you know a championship team or, or to compete. You know, what he wanted to do was just promote his dog. <laughs> Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seats Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The 10-Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue, uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called the national forgotten league by Dan Daly, entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to and audible's got it by the way, two, uh, two guests perhaps that we'll have on the show, hopefully sometime soon. But again, Go to audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30 day trial, as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now back to our conversation. Okay, so let's talk about uh, uh, how Thorpe puts together a team. Um, for 1922, right, uh, the team gets purchased, and, and the idea is it's largely going to be a road team. Uh, but there are a couple of home games. What, what is what is sort of the, the, the mechanics of that? Like, are they going to play a couple of home games? They're going to practice in Ohio, I gather. Um, can you maybe give a little background of that and maybe how Thorpe yeah. went about uh, putting a team together in the first place? Yeah, well, yeah, the, the, the first summer that they built the team, uh, I mean, they were obviously limited because there's, I mean, you're, you're only getting Native American football players. So, but because Thorpe went to Carlisle, uh, there was Haskell, uh, there was Sherman out in California. So there were some Indian schools that had played football that he had candidates. Uh, and there was a mixture of both of older players that he knew. I mean, obviously Thorpe was in his thirties too. And then there were some younger players that had just finished school that might've been in their twenties. So, but he was limited mainly the talent level. Like he was able to find, you know, about, you know, 15 to 16 players, 17 players the first year, you know, um, but only a handful of them you would consider NFL players, you know, obviously, Jim Thorpe, Pete Kalak were the, probably the two of the best, you know, in the NFL or, or Native American players. And Joe Guyon was the, the sort of the big three. You know, Guyon had played at Carlisle and at Georgia Tech and had been a really good pro player and obviously went into the um, Pro Football Hall of Fame uh, in 1966. You know, Thorpe was the other Hall of Famer. But they were limited talent-wise because some of the players had played a lot. Some of the players had not played a lot. So – he almost had to recruit guys who were willing to give up like three months of time from their families to go play football. So, um, but they were all native Americans. Um, and they, and they all sort of gave, you know, uh, their time, like I said, and mainly maybe because to play for Jim Thorpe, but he was, there definitely was a deficiency in the talent level. Like if this was just a pure NFL team, you know, you could see why they didn't win that many games. 
Uh, and how about Thorpe as a coach? Uh, wasn't there some speculation or, frankly, some some um, some thought that maybe he wasn't necessarily the best uh, potential coach for a team? Obviously, he's a good player, but um, what was he a, a decent player coach or or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think at the time, I mean, I think he gets a, a little bit of a bad rap, you know, uh, because people thought he was just pure talent and he was a little bit lazy. And, you know, he didn't coach guys very well. But but when he was with Canton, and, you know, they won the sort of pro championship in, in 1916, 17, and 1919, he had a lot of input in the way the team was run, you know, whether it was offensively, defensively, you know, you know, punting the ball, you know, strategy-wise. So when he took over the Urang Indians, uh, they had daily practice sessions. They were one of the few teams, you know, I think that practiced – for multiple hours, you know, they worked at the kennel in the morning, you know, from like 8 a.m. To, to 1 o'clock, had lunch. Then they would practice, you know, from like 1 to 5. It was like a four-hour session in the small field there. And, and then they would uh, have dinner, rub downs, and then they would actually run the dogs at night. But they had daily practices, you know, where where they trained and in, in, in sort of went over their skills and, and, you know, and that type of stuff. It was just maybe hard for him now, sometimes he might have lost interest. I think that was obvious in some of the games that the, the Ring Indians played. But he had limited talent. But also, the main idea of the team was to sell dogs. It was to perform, you know, with the dogs at halftime. And so, if you got behind, you know, you know, early in the game, you might have lost interest. You're like, oh, we're just here to sell dogs, and you might not have competed. But if you were in the game, maybe he coaches it up. So. Uh, I mean, he wasn't the greatest coach, and there were times that he might have allowed, you know, the players to do certain things, you know, or allowed them to, to relax or or whatever. But I, I think at times he, he coached them up. Uh, there was one story in the book that I wanted to tell that I thought was very interesting. Is um, in, in the first season they played the Dayton Triangles in the first game, and they got crushed thirty-six to nothing. So you might think, oh yeah, they don't care. He's a bad coach. But that following week, he went to Waterlingo and said, we need to get better at fundamentals. We need to get better at tackling. And they bought uh, one of the sort of first sort of bucking machines, which was kind of like a blocking sled, and they bought tackling dummies. And there's articles in newspapers, in the Marion newspapers that say that, oh, at the practice field, you know, the, the Indians have, are – you know, sort of learning better how to do, you know, the techniques with the, with the dummies and the, and the 3000 pound blocking machine. Like, so if he didn't care, he wouldn't have gone to lingo and sort of purchased these type of things or spent the extra money, you know, and they also played a, a non-conference game a little bit later against Bucyrus on like a Wednesday in front of a hundred fans because it was sort of arranged kind of late. So it was, but it was more of a practice game because he wanted the guys to get more practice, you know? So I think, you know, like I said, there are times where he didn't coach as well. Um, but there are also times where I think he sort of went out of his way to try to make the team better. I think it's also important to recognize that, you know, circa 1922 and, and the, you know, the years around that time, right. There was the NFL with actual teams in the league and a circuit uh, but there was also a hefty dollop of independent football teams out there, right? And that that seemed to be the combination of the schedule that the uh, that the Uring Indians were playing in '22 it was a little bit of NFL teams, but also independent teams too, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, oh, all the NFL teams played non-league teams, you know, especially through the '20s, '30s, even into the '40s, and. It was just a way to make extra money. Also, they were kind of practice games to get guys in shape. You know, they didn't have long – I mean, they didn't have any off-seasons or, you know, training camp was really only a couple weeks too. Uh, so it wasn't like they were – nowadays where you prepare all year and you're kind of in really good shape. And you know, But, no, they would play these non-league teams. Uh, some of them were really good. Like you mentioned, Memphis Tigers were really competitive. Probably could have been an okay NFL team, you know, if they were in the league. But, yeah, uh, the Orangans, if you want to uh, – I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself, but they – only played 20 NFL games and they went four and 16. <laughs> so they uh, were three and six in 1922 in the NFL and they were one and 10 the second year. They, they kind of lost interest the second year, but they also, you know, um, won some of those non-league games, you know, so which were against teams that were okay, you know, you know, but that was very popular back then to subsidize the sort of league games with some of these sort of non 
league teams, you know, um, to get, help you get better and also to make some a few extra bucks. <laughs> well, st- still pretty respectable, right? I mean, you know, given a, a team that uh, you know didn't exist the year before, you know, going three and six in the in the league, five and eight overall, it's not not too bad as a start. But regardless of that on field performance, right? There was always these halftime shows. Do you want to maybe mm-hmm. speak a bit about what what that was all about, and obviously a big part of yeah. why uh, of why the team existed in the first place to promote the dogs, but uh, maybe a little bit of a hint about what what a halftime show was like. Yeah, well, Water Lingo. I mean, obviously that was his main reason to start the team was to promote uh, his dog kennel and his Airedale. So, so at, at, so most of the games when they traveled, they did travel with the dogs. Uh, there was one article that said they took a pet coyote to one game, but what they would do is. Um, you know, during halftime, which was, wasn't very long, you know, it was, it was just a shorter halftime, but they would bring out the dogs and they would sort of put on uh, this little, little wild west show. So the dogs would do tricks. I think one of the big climax of, they would be a rescue dog and it would kind of save this person. Cause you got to think this is coming off world war one too. So uh, some of these Airedales had been in the war. They had performed these rescue missions, you know, of saving the soldier. So they would, sort of do these little wild west with the Indians, you know, to sort of promote the dogs and what they could do. And then the climax would be maybe the dog saves his soldier and you can, oh, wow, these dogs are very special. You know, they can do all these things. They can hunt. They can save lives. And so so all this big sort of entertainment, which we take for granted now, you know, Lingo thought of in 1922, you know, 90 plus years ago. So, um, but that was a huge part of Lingo sort of, wanting to do the team and to do these sort of halftime shows. Was it, uh, based on your research, was this uh, kind of the first uh, concept around a, a, a halftime entertainment? Uh, or, or, you know, it's, it seems like based on some of the things that I've read and, and some of your, your writings in this book, that maybe this was almost sort of the uh, beginnings of the modern day halftime show in professional football. I wouldn't say it's a first, like, you know, uh, but it was definitely one of the earliest, especially in the NFL, you know, to, to have a sort of halftime or any type of entertainment. And usually probably just went to the sidelines for a couple and then came back out, you know, but it was still, uh, you know, uh, even a decade or two before even some type of entertainment besides maybe a band for a time. So, so definitely this is one of the earliest, if not the first sort of maybe planned entertainment type of thing for, you know, fans, you know, to, to experience while at an NFL game. Do you think it played some effect on how they performed in the field, especially in the second halves of these games because of their inability to uh, take some rest during halftime and have to put on a show in between the two halves? Yeah, I think some of the players, some games you could see you, maybe they, they got a little worn out or like, oh, wow, it's it's only seven to nothing at the half during the game. And then all of a sudden, you know, they lose 30, to, you know, 30 to nothing because they maybe they were a little bit tired. But there were some games where they competed for four quarters, you know, uh, especially the first year, the first year they were much better at trying to make the effort, trying to play hard, do the show. Um, and I think Lingo knew that, you know, maybe they scaled down at certain times for the show because especially like I said, that first game they they, get, they lose 36 to nothing. You didn't want them to get, have those scores every week. You wanted fans to like, Oh wait, be somewhat interested that they might play a good game, <laughs> you know, because if the scores are 50 to nothing, 30, then fans would probably not even bother coming. So they knew they, that's why I mentioned the Thorpe getting the, 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 you know, the tackling dummies, the bucket machines and having the extra games. Cause they knew that they at least had to be somewhat, you know, competitive on the field if they wanted people to at least show up, you know, uh, and they did the, the, the attendance figures were really good, you know, uh, for both seasons and definitely, especially in 1922. When do you think the players kind of, um, you know, uh, either lost interest or, or, or kind of, you know, resigned themselves to the fact that they were more of a, I don't know, a show than they were a team or, or, or did that not even creep in? I mean, I get the sense that not all of them were fully on board, so to speak, when, when the show came around at halftime and, and the real, you know, deal behind why the team was there in the first place. I think the players, for the most part, the first year they were into, they bought into, they they played for, they played hard for Thorpe. There, there were only, I think, three games the first year that they they sort of got out of hand. Um, the second year, um, it, sort of in the mid, middle of the year, there was some interest. They had like three or four games where they didn't score a single point, uh, you know, and got beat like fifty-seven to nothing, you know, twenty-six to nothing, like you know, twenty-eight to nothing. Um, so I, I think the middle of the second year, maybe competitively, and then at the end of the year they actually turned it on, which I think they knew that this was only going to probably last 
two years um, because the last couple of games in 1923, they played some of their better football. They, they almost beat the Cardinals in Chicago, uh, lost by three, and then they actually won their last game that they ever played in Louisville, who wasn't a good team per se, So, but they went out and won that game, which was their only win in the NFL in 23. But I think for the most part, I think they – they understood why they were playing, you know, mainly for the advertisement. But especially a lot of these players, this was their only time they played in the NFL. And Guyon and Kalak, they played for other teams. And I think I mentioned this in the book. I think there was only four other players who went on to play any NFL game, which wasn't much, after 1923. So most of them just went back to their reservations, went back to their families, and never played a down of football Again, you know, so they, I think, appreciated all just this time playing for Jim Thorpe, who were somewhat of an idol to some of these players, especially the younger ones. So I think for the most part, they kind of knew what they were getting into and they just allowed it to play out, you know, um, to the extent that it did. So what do you think was the uh, straw that broke uh, the camel's back for, for Lingo and his ownership of the team? Because obviously, you know, 1923, I guess they, you know, they had a 1-10 in 10 record all, overall, I think it was. And, you know, uh, obviously, uh, you know, w- was it losing even promotional power? I mean, why did he, why did he kind of end no, it all after the, the 23 uh, season, do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I think, no, I think it just ran its course. You know, uh, he, he was in the dog business. He wasn't in the pro football business, the NFL business. Um, I, I think he liked being around the Indians. I think he liked being at the games a little bit, you know, you know, tra- traveling. But I think after the second year, he's like, I'm done with what, what am I going to next? And, and that's what he did for the next, you know, he would go on to the next promotional item. And, you know, he went and did a, a sporting magazine, which Thorpe actually helped do a little bit, probably mainly for his name. He, he didn't do a lot of the writing, but he did a sporting magazine. He developed more, you know, uh, sold more dogs and, and things like that, you know, before uh, he had uh, the depression and, and the bankrupt, bankruptcy, you know, and things like that. But no, he just went on to his next promotional item, you know, it, you know, mainly was the sporting magazine, you know, that he did next. So, so it wasn't anything that sort of, Oh wow, we're not winning or, you know, cause the attendance figures in 23 were still pretty strong. They were getting four, even 5,000, which at the time was very good for an NFL game. But, he just said, uh, two years, let's go on. What's, what's the next thing? <laughs> you know, what's my next promotional thing? You know, oh, I, I want to do the sporting magazine. Do I, uh, do I have this right? My, uh, that, that lingo, uh, attempted to do something similar in, uh, using basketball and even Jim Thorpe, uh, later in the decade. Well, I think they, there was like, a, I think it was more baseball. They did a little bit of the other sports, but it wasn't as big as joining a, a pro league. It was more mainly they, they just played a few exhibition games, uh, the Oorang name or whatever, but, uh, but was not in a league. They didn't play Major League Baseball. They didn't play in a league in basketball. It was just a Native American team traveling. Okay, so what do you, what do you think then is – what legacies, if any, uh, come from this? Obviously, it's a curious little uh, footnote in, in pro football history, right? It, it speaks obviously to – uh, the, uh, the the relatively scruffy nature of of the NFL at that time. Uh, it's clearly a, 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 a an amazing promotional platform and opportunity. Are there any other sort of things that sort of come out from from this, and perhaps maybe why the story was uh, you know kind of buried for such a long period of time? Well, I think it definitely is one of the more unique stories to the NFL's rags to riches. You know, overall sort of historical tale. You know, like there's a few things that you can point to and like uh, the Orang Indians is one of them, you know, uh, they were, like I said, even though they only played 20 games, which doesn't sound like a lot, they were one of the biggest um, draws of those couple years. You know, they, the league needed publicity. They needed stars like Jim Thorpe to play um, their, their average. I think the average NFL crowd was like 2,500 or 2,600 uh, in 22 and 23, well, they averaged almost uh, over 3,000 to 4,000 fans. And I think eight of their nine games in the first year, they uh, were over 4,000, uh, 4, you know, three to, you know, three to 4,000 every game, you know, so including a couple of them that were double the average uh, of regular NFL games. So, and also uh, the one thing Lingo did was, um, he uh, had photos taken of the team, you know, of individual players and the team. And they were in newspapers all across the country and in the cities that they played in, which 
every NFL team wasn't doing at the time. So I think the legacy uh, is helping, even if it was just for the two years, helping, you know, sort of the publicity and uh, promotion of the NFL on a positive level. Like, you know, fans were going, even if they just went for Jim Thorpe or even for the dogs, they still were going out to games and it sort of helped uh, the sort of NFL. And I think overall, when you see how the, the NFL is now, this is part of, of its legacy. Like, hey, this is how it got started. These are some of the stories that are important to why the NFL is as big as it is today. Has the NFL ever formally uh, either recognized or celebrated uh, uh, this team, uh, the story behind it? I mean, look, you had, uh, you know, in, in, on one level, right, you had, um, by my estimation, I think up to, I think it was like 10 Indian tribes that were represented by uh, uh, players on the, the two seasons of this team. I mean, it seems to me like this is a um, a very worthwhile and, and frankly, uh, important uh, opportunity to um, – uh, go back into to history and to uh, remember this in some way, shape, or form. I clearly the Indians did not sort of absorb themselves or get absorbed into a current uh, franchise lineage. But uh, I'm just wondering if the league either has or maybe has plans someday to somehow either formally recognize or throw back or something uh, for this story and team. Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't think it's done a sort of major thing, you know, so to speak. Um, I know in 1997, uh, the Ohio Historical Society put a historical marker up at the old practice site where they played. So, and it has a picture of the team on it. Um, And during that celebration and the unveiling of that historical marker, I know the former commissioner of the NFL, Paul Tagalu, wrote a letter to the town sort of you know, acknowledging, you know, this um, sort of big event that they were getting this historical marker and also that they are the smallest town to ever have an NFL franchise. And it's going to be a record that's never going to be broken. It had 800, 800 citizens. <laughs> so I'm pretty safe to say that that's a record that's never going to be broken. But so th- they've helped a little bit along the way, you know, uh, you know, they haven't acknowledged, you know, maybe a big thing, you know, for, you know, Leiru or the Orang Indians, but the town does still, you know, appreciate that they had this little moment, you know, for two years. And like I said, that historical marker is pretty uh, nice to have there. As you drive into the town, you can see it, you know, where the old practice site was. So it's definitely, um, that's something that they can hold their hat on. We think it be, could be fodder for somebody in Hollywood, right? Um, I mean, uh, it's interesting uh, based on my research. I mean, you had some some really just some great names that you could create a story, you know, semi uh, semi accurate if you wanted to, right? I mean, Stillwell Sanuk and uh, <laughs> Joe Little Twig, and uh, of course uh, Eagle Feather and uh, uh, Baptiste Thunder. I mean, these are real names of real players. <laughs> Uh, who uh, who donned the uniforms of the uh, Orang U- uh, Indians in uh, in the early twenties in the NFL? And uh, you just, I mean, just saying those names alone to a creative type is probably a, a fodder right there for a story that could be set during those times. And clearly, some of the things that you've uh, unearthed in your uh, exhaustive research of this team uh, could be brought to bear, perhaps on a more uh, uh, you know public platform like a movie or something like that. I, I just wonder if uh, anybody's even circled around this idea as possibly a story. Uh, for for a movie, I have not heard. You know, like I said, it does have some, you know, sort of Hollywood tales that you can bring out. You know, an all Native American team being run by a doll kennel owner in a small Ohio town, where they're traveling to. You know, big cities like Chicago. Uh, you know, you know, you know, they go to Canton, Minneapolis, Milwaukee, St. Louis, Cleveland. Like they're traveling these these cities to play football games, but also to advertise. So it does have a little bit of, you know, you know, you can write a Hollywood script to it, you know, and, and you're right, you know, and that's one thing Linga also did, you know, some of those, you know, you could use their Indian names, but he would give Indian names also just to make it a little bit, you know, sort of, you know, I, I think some of the players were, you know, Leon Botwell was named Little Cyclone, you know, uh, you know, like you mentioned Eagle Feather, that was Sherman Pierce, but, you know, Red Fang, he gave one, player bob hill war horse you know so you know war eagle woodchuck like so all these sort of uh you know names that you think hey you know but this actually happened it wasn't made up <laughs> these were uh either their indian names or you know given the nickname or, or whatever so it's uh it definitely has a, a little uh, hollywood feel to it well we put this out to our listeners right so anybody in the la area and we do have a few hollywood types that uh, somehow have discovered the show and, and have found some fodder for 
uh, for uh, things to explore further. The book is called Walter Lingo, Jim Thorpe, and the Oorang Indians, How a Dog Kennel Owner Created the NFL's Most Famous Traveling Team. Uh, the author is Chris Willis, who has been our guest. Uh, it, the uh, book is published by uh, Roman and Littlefield, and as they say, um, you can find it wherever good books are found. We'll have a link to it on our website and all that. Uh, Chris, this is uh, really interesting stuff. And by the way, I, I highly encourage folks to uh, seek out this book. There's some really great pictures in here, uh, as well as some very uh, detailed information about sort of the whole sort of legacy story behind all of this. And, you know, it's kind of, it, this is truly, in my mind, of the stories that we've expl- uh, explored so far. You know, it's kind of the uh, truth is stranger than fiction. I mean, I, I don't know if you could script this idea, right, and have it believed uh, by most people that a, a dog owner wants to promote kennels and do halftime shows and, oh, by the way, is going to uh, leverage uh, a fledgling uh, uh, franchise in a still uh, embryonic National Football League uh, as the mechanism to do it. Hard to believe, but it's true. And and I think it's a, it's an amazing story that you were uh, – uh, smart enough and um, creative enough to uh, to delve into and, and, and bring to life. So I, I thank you so much for letting us uh, hear more about this story. Um, maybe you want to uh, give us a, a sense of, of what else you're doing now, what other topics that you might be focused on. And obviously, you've got a day job at the NFL, but I got to think it's a treasure trove of other potential ideas for you. Yeah, I'm already, I moved on to my next uh, book idea. Um, if you don't know, in 2019, the NFL will be celebrating its 100th season. So it's going to be a big uh, fall and year for NFL history. So I'm going to tackle a biography on sort of the NFL's first superstar, and that's Jim, uh, Red Grange. So it's going to be a full-scale biography on uh, the Galloping Ghost, and it'll come out the fall of 2019. Uh, Rowan and Littlefield will publish it uh, too. Um, but I'm uh, knee-deep in, in the Galloping Ghost right now. That's great, Chris. Well, good luck with the uh, upcoming uh, NFL season. Uh, good luck with that book, too, and hopefully we'll stay in touch and maybe we'll uh, – we may actually ping you for some uh, potential imponderables as we uh, uh, delve deeper into various uh, nooks and crannies of the uh, of the old NFL and the current NFL and the lineages that we discover. So I look forward to staying in touch, and thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for having me, Tim. I appreciate it. I had a good time. All right. Thank you to our guest, Chris Willis from NFL Films. Uh, probably has the coolest job out there uh, as the resident historian for uh, the treasure trove that is the NFL Films uh, organization. We thank him for uh, regaling us in this interesting story, if you're listening out there in Hollywood, about this uh, interesting team from the early 20s NFL called the Urang Indians. Uh, the book is, again, titled Walter Lingo, Jim Thorpe, and the Urang Indians, How a Dog Kennel Owner Created the NFL's Most Famous traveling team. It is published by Roman and Littlefield, uh, and it is available wherever fine books are found, including uh, a link off of our episode description on goodseatsstillavailable.com, our website, uh, where you can uh, get a a copy with one click uh, of this book, as well as uh, a bunch of other books that Chris has written, uh, including The Columbus Panhandles, A Complete History of Pro Football's Toughest Team, uh, 1900 to 1922, published in uh, 2007 by Scarecrow Press. Uh, the Man Who Built the National Football League, Joe F. Carr, uh, which came out by uh, Scarecrow in uh, 2010. I also want to uh, mention, too, that uh, Chris is uh, an Emmy Award winner last year uh, for his contributions uh, to uh, HBO's uh, hit series Hard Knocks, uh, which was uh, that year was the uh, the story behind the uh, the lead up and the current and the season of uh, the Houston Texans. Uh, so um, interesting uh, background and stories uh, told by Chris Willis, and we thank him again for uh, being part of our show for this week. Uh, we want to thank you, of course, for listening as always, and we also like to thank you for uh, giving us a, a shout out or a follow on our various social media platforms. Uh, if you're on Twitter, you'll find us at Good Seats Still. Uh, if you are on Facebook, you uh, can like us there. Uh, if you're on Instagram, you can uh, find us at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, and um, uh, let us know what your thoughts are. If you go to the website, GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com, you can send us email and all that kind of stuff, too. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And please uh, keep your cards and letters coming, as they say. And uh, once again, we thank our uh, production friends at Podfly, Eric Begay, Jerry Payne, Corey Coates, 
David Gregerson. Thank you to Podfly uh, for all your uh, podcast producing needs. Feel free to visit them at podfly.net and uh, tell them that Tim Hanlon and the Good Seeds podcast sent you. Uh, We will see you next week with another fun-filled episode. Who knows what we'll be talking about next, but uh, I assure you it will be interesting and curious, and uh, we uh, look forward to speaking to you then. Take care. Until next week, take care, everybody.